All right, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Again, this is a webinar getting started with Timescale DB and defining best practices. Um, my name is Melanie, I work with Timescale, and I'm here to intro uh, our incredible David Cohen, who's our software engineer with Timescale, and uh, he's gonna move forward with our webinar. So David, take it away. Hi folks, uh, this is David. Uh, I'm a software engineer and solutions architect here at Timescale. Um, and uh, I'll be presenting on uh, best practices with time DB and getting started today. Um, uh, some of this, is, you know, if you guys are experienced with time DB, some of this may be, be a repeat, um, but I'm sure there'll be some good stuff for you there. Um, and uh, if you're new, this is a great way to get started. Um, one thing here, uh, especially because we have a pretty pretty small group, at least so far, of course, more people may be joining over the course of this, this whole thing. Um, uh, please feel free to put questions in the chat uh, on the side uh, whenever you have them. Uh, I'll try and pause at a few points just to, to let you get some of those in, as well as just to, to pause and see if I can answer a few of those. Um, I think Melanie will, will, will sort of be voicing some of those just so that we don't have to deal with audio going back and forth and back and forth and all of that, because uh, that's no fun at all. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, if I can get this to change. So we'll start off with, with just why TimescaleDB. So the basic gist of, of why we built TimescaleDB is, is that existing databases aren't really built for time series, at least existing relational databases. They're hard to scale. Um, and, and as you start having these time series workloads, which are generally insert mostly, most of the data is coming in at the leading edge, um, uh, but they still may, might have some updates or traditional relational workloads, which are usually pretty update heavy. Uh, writes are happening to random parts of your table, uh, random parts of indexes across multiple relations. Um, that's sort of the workload that we see often with relational data or even our metadata. So the stuff that describes what a time, time series uh, set actually, actually is working on, but not necessarily the time series itself. Time series is much more insert mostly. So you're mostly writing new data um, in approximate time order, not completely time ordered, but at least approximate. Um, and the problem is that, that that normal relational databases just sort of fall down under that workload. But then uh, the databases that have been built more for time series workloads specifically are usually NoSQL, um, which means they sacrifice query complexity. They also sacrifice a known query language. Um, and it means that your metadata, so all the data that describes the time series data, and the, the time series data itself end up in two different places. And that ends up being siloed. It ends up making for really more complex applications. Um, I always sort of say that, you know, you can write a join uh, in your application, but uh, the idea that your developers writing this join in half an hour are gonna be better than the optimized code that's been written uh, over 25 years in Postgres and Timescale is probably not right. Um, so, uh, we are an open source uh, time series database powered by Postgres, and we are optimizing for fast performance at scale. We do this through a hyper table. Um, it allows us to ingest millions of data points a second, scale the hundreds of billions of rows um, in a single, what looks like a single table to you. And we maintain the full SQL API. So one of our main goals with the project is to, to, to just keep that, that way of interacting with your data uh, very similar to how you normally would uh, in a normal relational Postgres table. Um, under the hood, of course, uh, sorry, and, and, and that also means you can have indexes, triggers, constraints, foreign keys, do upserts, all sorts of table management, et cetera. So how do we leverage Postgres? So the first thing that we do uh, is that we leverage uh, 20 years of the Postgres like storage engine, all of the stuff that Postgres does normally, we we allow, and then we manage the 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 schema for you. So as data comes in, we automatically and transparently chunk it into basically subtables or partitions, um, and then al that allows us to also do all sorts of stuff around data lifecycle management, um, as well as massively speeding ingest over just a normal Postgres table. Um, we also optimize the query planner. So for time series specific queries, uh, we have specific optimizations around the query planner itself that uh, exclude chunks based on time. Um, normal SQL queries are just gonna go through the normal Postgres query planner. So we take the time series queries, we optimize those, and the normal ones just fall through. Um, and then we add on to the full SQL compatibility, uh, our own set of time series functions. Um, and that's really to make things that are 
possible in SQL. SQL is, at least in, in theory, Turing complete. Um, so you can write any computer program in SQL, um, but you might not want to. Uh, it, it, it often is not structured perfectly. It's not necessarily going to be efficient. So we also offer all these sorts of time series functions that allow you to do certain types of queries significantly more efficiently than you would in a normal uh, SQL query, as well as just uh, adding, making it much easier to do so. Um, so that that operations on time series are just more natural uh, and far more easy, far easier to do. And it means we inherit the entire Postgres ecosystem. So all of the things that connect to Postgres uh, can connect to Timescale and talk to it just as if it's a normal time series uh, uh, Postgres database. Uh, but now you've got your time series uh, workload supported as well. Um, they can use a lot of those functions because uh, many of them are at least look like, as we said, we build into the SQL API. So they look just like a normal Postgres function. And all of the, the work that's happening to, to redo uh, how they actually run is happening completely on the back end in the planner and the executor and then special nodes that we create underneath the hood so that that's more efficient. But you don't have to rewrite your query to do that. That's all happening just inside the, the database itself. So how are people using timescale? Um, one big thing is that that you're simplifying your time series infrastructure. So you have time series data alongside your relational data or ge geospatial data for geotemporal analyses alongside your event data. Um, and you want to be able to relate all of that together in one place. Um, and that's one huge thing that we're able to do that other databases aren't necessarily able to. Um, so being able to take all of that data, put it in one place, and have only one set of databases to maintain, to tune, to learn, um, with that very standard SQL interface that more developers in the world know than pretty much any other language. And it spans multiple industries, everything from IoT to DevOps and monitoring to financial data and, and all sorts of uh, software as a service type apps where you're looking at uh, near real time operational dashboarding, for instance. That's a huge thing that we see very frequently. So let's get into some of the best practices for using, because I think probably a lot of you already know a bit about timescale. Um, so uh, best practices for using timescale. Um, and so we're going to go, uh, and I think I forgot one here, but that's fine. We'll, we'll get there when we get there. Um, uh, our agenda here, basically, we're going to go through a few rules and, 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 and ways of using uh, timescale to make sure that your data is modeled efficient, uh, effectively and that you're going to get the best performance out of it as, as quickly as possible. So our first rule is to access in-memory data as much as possible. So in general, as data comes in, it comes in this time order. Right, so uh, older data, and I guess this is actually sort of showing up backwards, but whatever. Uh, older data um, uh, comes in, and then as we move forward, we, we divide that all into chunks. So in general, we want to make sure that our chunks are the right size, so that recent chunks uh, fit into memory. And mainly, what we want to want to make sure of, in order to achieve the highest ingest rates, is that the recent um, uh, the, ch the the indexes on the recent chunks fit in memory. So one of the big things that we that we uh, allow for is you can create lots of indexes um, that would otherwise cause some Postgres tables to fall over if you were just ingesting into a single table um, with billions of rows, say, uh, because they're they're sort of more random access. You can still create those. And as long as they're fitting in memory, we sort of are basically making it so that the recent indexes um, are smaller only on the most recent chunks. And so those can fit in memory and they don't have to be, we're not sort of intermingling older data and more recent data in the indexes, um, but they're still very effective because most queries end up having some sort of time component on them. So we still are only accessing those indexes that we need to. Um, so you can manually set your chunk size on by using the set chunk time interval function. Um, and ideally, you want to make sure that your, your chunks make up around, at most, your most recent chunks make up around 25% of main memory. That is across all hypertables. So if you have 25 hypertables, um, then you need to make sure that your chunks across all those hypertables, not just each one individually, fit into 25% of main memory. And that 25% of main memory is a rule of thumb here. It's about the size of shared buffers that, that we usually set. Um, and I can go into some more of that tuning later. Um, so the other thing that, 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 that we allow here for is, as you're doing this in production, your chunk size, as your data ingest grows, um, you'll want to take a look at your chunk size and make sure that it's staying within that 25%. So in general, um, you don't want your chunks to be too big. You also don't want them to be too small. 
uh, we have had a few people who, who decided, hey, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, I'm going to use space partitioning as well as time partitioning, and I'm going to create tons of chunks so that I maybe have almost one row per chunk. That's also not efficient. You want to make sure that you have a, a fairly large number of rows per chunk. Um, don't go too crazy and, and create thousands and thousands and thousands of chunks. Of course, we can handle that, but we want to make sure that we still are, are, um, are, are using our indexes effectively. So often, if you're trying to achieve something where you have a, a, a small number of rows per chunk, what you really want is an index. So let's build the right index on on those rows, and that's going to give you the speed up that you need instead of trying to put 10 rows in a chunk, um, because that's not the efficient way to do that. So um, in general, my sort of rule of thumb here is if you have fewer than a few hundred thousand or a million rows per chunk, it's probably a little too small. Um, and if you have more than, say, tens or 20, 40 million rows per chunk, then it's probably a little too big and you would probably benefit from going a little bit smaller on your chunk size. Um, there are some other considerations that I'll get into later as we get into things like compression, et cetera. Um, but for right now, I'd say that that's the sort of main uh, consideration um, for setting it. And, and that's just sort of a rule of thumb that I would use. Um, of course, it depends on your hardware and all of that stuff. Uh, just one thing to know also, your, your new chunk size is applied only after the current chunk is full. So you will want to set that chunk size to approximately where you want to uh, early. Uh, if you end up going too big and setting it to a month, you sort of have to wait a month. We can't actually revise the, the sizes of the chunks uh, as of now, uh, once they're open and being inserted into. Um, eventually, maybe we'll allow that with like a full table lock or something, but it's still gonna be a pretty disruptive operation. So in general, I'd say err on the side of a little bit too small, check in, on a fairly regular basis to see if your ingest rate is growing and if your chunks are, are suddenly getting bigger. And if they are, then you may want to decrease your, your chunk size a bit um, as, you, as you're growing, and that'll take effect for, for more recent chunks. So in general, one of the things that we try to do then is select chunks globally uh, via constraints and then select locally within the with, with indexes. So this is sort of the thing that we talked about where uh, that constraint exclusion works quite well for, for like higher level um, uh, operations around chunks uh, and, and selecting down to the right set of chunks, but it's not as efficient as indexes for selecting individual rows. So if you need an index in order to, to, to do your, um, to do fast selects on individual rows or a, a smaller subset of rows, that's a great way to use uh, that, that's a great thing to do, as well as uh, are, are using constraint exclusion. So you can't rely completely on constraint exclusion, but it's very useful for, for making sure that our uh, indexes are created properly and that uh, we're only looking at the most recent set of chunks. Um, and we have a number of other features that, that we've added uh, over time. So we do uh, certain types of appends and limits uh, to make sure that we're only looking at the at the uh, most recent chunks. We have better plan time exclusion to make sure that we're only looking at chunks that are possibly uh, part of the plan um, that decreases our, our planning time considerably for larger numbers of chunks. Uh, we also have execution time uh, uh, optimizations. Um, and I'll pause here. Uh, actually, let me just, I'll, I'll cover this slide and then I think we're about to move on to our second rule, so I'll pause for, for questions. Um, so the other thing that, that, that is really helpful here is that, that we integrate completely with explain uh, planning in Postgres. So if you're used to using explain plans, um, it's a really huge option. This is one thing that, 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 that we found when we were trying out some of the NoSQL and other types of, of, of things is that it was much harder to get uh, an idea of what was going on inside the planner and the executor of some of these other, other databases. And so it was really great to be able to use explain in order to actually figure out what was going on and be able to add indexes, do so, some of the normal query optimization we would do um, on, 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 a, on a database. So I'll pause here before we move on to rule two uh, for some questions. Okay, so uh, the first question I have um, regarding chunks is, uh, is it possible to rechunk older chunks, like archiving older chunks per year? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking there, and maybe you can clarify, but um, so there are a couple couple things here. So uh, one, we'll get into some of the things that you can do with 
uh, older data. Um, there's a number of different options that we add on for dealing with older data effectively, including moving older chunks to uh, different types of hardware or different types of disks. Um, that's one thing. In terms of archiving older data, we do allow dropping it and you can take backups of it. We haven't uh, added backups on a per chunk basis just yet. Um, if that's what you were asking, then the other thing that you might be asking is can you consolidate older chunks? So if you have, say, monthly chunks and you want to consolidate them into a yearly chunk, um, right now we don't do that because it's not horribly useful for a lot of the things that we do. Um, uh, it's usually better to just leave them alone and not rewrite the data. Um, we are looking at adding that as an option in future versions, though, for 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 a few uh, other features that we are adding in where that might be useful. But I'd say for now, um, in general, it's not as useful to 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 do that for older data. Um, often the chunking has more uh, has more impact on inserts than on queries, um, and there isn't much value in separating it into like merging older chunks right now just yet. One more. Okay, another question. Uh, does it work with clustered environments? Uh, yes, I will get into some of that uh, later in the presentation. So I'll uh, say I'm going to save that for now. Um, and we'll get into that, I think, in rule five or six, something like that. Uh, uh, maybe maybe even in partially in this one. Um, so when we get through there, if you have more questions, feel free to put them in. So, uh, rule tool, efficiently leverage your hardware. So, I have a number of Postgres configs here. Um, they are very important, um, and I would go over each of them, except that we also have a tool uh, that allows you to do this uh, called Timescale Tune. Um, use it. it. It works pretty darn well. Um, if you need to get into more uh, deep tuning, uh, do feel free to visit our Slack channel. Uh, we have a support Slack where the community will help uh, with all th sorts of things like this. Um, one thing to, to just note is, um, in some cases, uh, Timescale Tune can see things around memory, et cetera, but it can't see as much around disk uh, size and, and space like that. So one thing to note is that sometimes we, we sort of set a default for uh, max wall size, and sometimes it can be very useful to actually tune max wall size up a little bit. Uh, but that's just a, a sort of note for cases where you're looking at very high in, in insert rates. Um, it can be helpful to tune your max wall size up a little higher. Um, uh, so then part two is choose the right hardware, or part three, excuse me. Um, so some considerations there. Uh, one is you want to make sure you have enough RAM and, of course, enough storage. Um, one thing that, that often will bite people is that the cloud providers especially, their storage space and their I.O. throughput tend to scale together. So even if your disk is going to be um, relatively small, uh, you may need to make it a bit bigger. So for instance, if, if, if say you want to have a separate wall disk from your data disk, which is something that, that we um, actually do recommend if you're, if you're really trying to get the fastest in, inserts, then having a separate wall disk and data disk is great. Your wall disk usually doesn't need to be huge. Uh, it could you could probably get away with a few hundred gigs, but if you're doing it on EBS rather than local, um, then you may need to make it larger just to support the throughput um, uh, that you need on that wall disk because they scale the throughput of the disk uh, correspondingly to the uh, to the size of the disk. Um, this can also be a slight issue if you're using uh, different machines in a cloud environment because they also have a separate limitation on the machine's IO throughput that is separate from the disk uh, IO limitation. And then you have to add both of them. You have to like figure out which one is actually going to be the limiting factor depending on how many disks and the size of the machine. And it's a real pain. Um, uh, but the, the, the answer is if you read the documentation very, very carefully, you can usually figure this out. Uh, but you can also usually just say, okay, I'm going to run some tests and see if I'm IO limited. Uh, if I seem to always be hitting the same IO rate on these disks and I can't get any higher, um, then probably I'm IO bound. Um, and I need to figure out what's going on there, or that's my limitation. Um, maybe I need to increase the size of my disk. Maybe I need to increase the size of the box, figure out what's going to, what's going to get me there from a, from an IO throughput point of view. 
Um, so that's just a sort of gotcha with uh, cloud environments. This can, can also bite you if you're if you're in an on-prem environment uh, and using uh, network ne network attached storage of any sort. Um, usually, we find that locally attached disks are much faster than any of the cloud options. So uh, people there are usually getting pretty good throughput, and 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 they're not seeing horrible uh, performance problems there. Okay, so that seems good. Um, and then uh, in terms of clustering, so we, so someone asked here about a clustered environment. So uh, we have, uh, we, we do support full Postgres replication, um, physical replication in this case. Uh, so we support synchronous replicas for high availability and scaling queries. So this is one thing about choosing the right hardware, right? It can be very useful to have uh, basically the master that's taking most of the write workload, um, and then a replica that's taking most of the read workload. And that's a, a sort of pattern that we see among a lot of our clients. Um, and, and that's something that, that I would say is, is a best practice at this point, where um, you do have your application sort of splitting out its read and its write queries, for the most part anyway. Um, and your, write, your, your read queries are going to the replicas, whereas the write queries are going to the master. And you do want to use synchronous replication because um, if you use asynchronous, then your replicas can fall sort of irreparably behind, especially at the high ingest rates that we are often running at. Um, and so even if you have at least one synchronous replica, that usually means that the replicas can catch up. This is partially just because Postgres can only use one process in order to do uh, to do replication. Um, so if, as long as you have one node that's keeping up, you, it usually means the other one might be very slightly behind, but that's fine. If it's 10 seconds behind and it's not growing, um, that, that might be okay for your workload. It, of course, depends on your work, on, on, on whether you need the most up-to-date data or if you're okay with being five seconds behind. But if you need the most up-to-date data, then you want synchronous replication turned on. We have a whole replication blog post um, if you want to learn more about some of the other settings that are available to you on that. Um, so that's uh, another thing that, 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 that could be useful for you. Um, and then we also, also often see people using asynchronous replicas and sometimes even detaching those replicas in order to use them for data science. Um, and then they'll sort of resync them with a, with a tool like PG Backrest or some other backup tool uh, when they're ready to go, go sort of back online after the data scientists have run their, their longer running queries on a box that may not need to be completely up to date. Um, so that's another thing that, that we see fairly frequently. Um, we also have uh, full HA solutions uh, using various tools for that, um, and, and we can get into some more of that if people people want to. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions, but then the other thing that, that I just wanted to mention is that the timescale will scale up and down with you. Uh, we have folks running um, on everything from a, a Raspberry Pi up to uh, very large servers, let's put it that way, uh, in, a, in a data center. and um, so, so choosing the right set of hardware for, for your needs, and often it's choosing the right set of hardware at different stages of your needs. So you might have something on the edge that's doing a little bit of uh, data gathering, maybe some aggregation or buffering, and then sending that back to something in the cloud, um, uh, which has more high availability needs and all sorts of other stuff that's sort of powering uh, your app. But there might be an edge device that that, that uses an Arduino-based uh, something or other. Now. Are you going to get the same ingest rate on a 32-bit uh, uh, machine uh, or, or a Raspberry Pi? No, obviously not. I want to make sure that your expectations are right, um, like your hardware doesn't matter. Um, but you can still use it, and it does still work. It's, it's very good as a persistence store for that sort of stuff. So now, thinking about data models. Um, so one big thing that we run into a fair amount is, should I use a wide or a narrow table? Um, so using a narrow table can, can really simplify your schema and make it easy to add uh, more metrics. Um, so you might have something like, uh, oops. So this might be say, uh, and uh, maybe I can, ooh, I can draw. Um, oops, no, I can't. Uh, it just changes the slide, Never mind. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, over on the, uh, on, on, I guess, uh, what is both of our lefts, uh, you'll see a metadata table, right? Which says, okay, for this, uh, say device or something like that, um, or this metric, um, right? Then, then I will, I will have, uh, I have an owner, I have an ID, I have a location for it, um, and then I, uh, I just have that ID over in my, um, 
my time series table, uh, right? That would be the hyper table over on the right, uh, along with the time that, that the data came in and a value. Um, so if I have a lot of different metrics, right? Let's say I wanted, I, I didn't know, I, you know, sometimes it was gonna be temp and pressure, but then other times it might be, um, I don't know, uh, uh, weight or all sorts of other types of metrics. I can't come, any, come up with anything right now because, you know, whatever. But um, the basic gist is uh, this is a great way to be able to sort of add lots of different metrics on the fly. You don't really know what those metrics are gonna be. Okay, so that's, a, that's one thing that you can do. Um, but if you know that there are a number of metrics, like, like if you have a, de a defined device that you're measuring, um, and you know basically the schema that that's going to return, even th if there are a few columns that you might not know. Um, and th there are a number of columns that are often queried together. For instance, uh, in order to do weather forecasting, I often need to know both the temperature and the pressure at the same time, right? So without one, like I I'm usually going to be querying both of those together. Um, so then I do want to store them in a wider table. Um, so if you know that sort of stuff, then that's a great way of, of structuring your data. And in fact, wider, wider columns will often be more efficient in, in certain ways than uh, narrower ones, though it sort of depends. Um, so, and, and in general, if you have some, uh, like a few columns that might be around every once in a while, uh, then you can use things like JSONB uh, in order to add new columns uh, or let's say you're adding new columns in a test environment, then you use the JSONB to add the column for a little bit, and then you create a view that it's, extracts it and it treats it like a real column. And then when you're ready to actually go into production with it, you say, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move that into its own column. Um, and that's a relatively easy operation there. Um, so uh, that, that's one good way of, of doing that sort of thing. Um, and that's kind of grainy, sorry about that. but. Uh, the other thing that, that it's, it, it's important to note is that it's totally okay to have sparse data. So if you have certain columns that don't appear very often, but uh, you know maybe appear in half your devices or, or, or even a, a quarter, and but like they're still there and relatively common, adding them as an extra column won't affect the rows that, or, or won't affect very much. It'll just have one bit mask for a nullable column. So one bit extra for nullable columns that are nulls. Um, so if you have sparse data and you wanna have nulls in there, that's totally fine. It's not going to affect your size very much. So um, basically the, 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 the basic gist here is you can use uh, wide or narrow tables. Um, you can use a wide table and, and that will allow you to reduce joins as well. So, so you don't have to join a table to itself quite as much or do filters or other types of ways of uh, getting your queries to work perfectly um, when you have um, when you have these narrower tables uh, or sorry uh, when you have these wider tables rather than these rather than narrower tables you can also build indexes where a certain value is not null if you have sparse columns um, and that can be very helpful uh, if you want to just index for those types of values and have your index be a bit smaller but in general, um, we would say that it's, it's, it's best practice to separate your metadata from your time series data. Uh, so your metadata table should be separate and you can do joins um, and other types of operations in order to get the set of metrics that you need to fetch from your time series table. What you don't wanna do is store over and over and over again the same set of uh, metadata um, that like on every row, for instance. So that, that is definitely an anti-pattern. Um, and then there are, there are things that, that we can talk about uh, sort of if we wanted to get more in depth, I think it would be on the uh, getting started uh, talk, but um, there are also ways of saying, okay, I have certain types of metadata that change um, uh, on some much more, that change with time, but often much less frequently than my normal metadata. Um, and I wanna be able to uh, basically carry those forward uh, in time um, and, and not have to store them on every row, but also uh, I need to know at certain times what the metadata is. Um, so there are ways of modeling that as well that, that, that can be quite good. So, uh, and this is a sort of a difference between uh, timescale and influx. 
uh, influx sort of only allows you to, to store tags, which are always strings, um, and then fields, which are bools, floats, ints, or strings, um, and they can't be indexed. Tags are, tags are always indexed, strings, uh, fields are not indexed. Um, we allow you to, to index on whatever sort of data you want, and all 40 plus supported data types, you do have to have time in there somewhere. Uh, we do time or at least some integer that can sort of take the place of time. Um, so that's that's an important uh, thing there. Um, so you can then create indexes. You can have your metadata tables for, for tags. Those can be indexed in different ways. So you, for instance, if you have lots of strings as tags um, and you want to do like queries on them, you can create JIT indexes, which allow for very fast, uh, uh, more full text uh, matching with like like queries. So those things are, are great uh, for that. Um, and it's okay to have foreign keys. You can have foreign keys um, from your, uh, uh, basically have a references uh, clause in say your user ID column, which then references back to the users table. Um, that will slow down in just a little bit because uh, there is a trigger there and it has to check that. Um, so, you know, that's that's one thing just to keep in mind. Um, but it's totally okay to do that, um, especially if you're not operating at the very edge of ingest rates. Um, that can still work great. And we will propagate all of that foreign key stuff down to the uh, down to our chunk tables. So um, all of the foreign key stuff happens automatically on the back end. We manage that for you. Okay, pause again for any questions that we have there. Okay, we have one question. In wide columns, you'd have the additional advantage to be able to use different column, column types, example, different precisions, right? Because narrow tables would mean that all values are stored the same, or how do you handle these use cases? Yeah, so so yes, different data types, uh, definitely easier to add different data types in um, with with a wider table. Um, in general, uh, not necessarily with precision, but um, we'll see people that are using uh, various types of ints, floats. If you're doing a narrow table, often what there's sort of two models there. Either we'll have two separate tables, uh, say one for ints, one for strings, or five separate tables if you have ints, strings, bools, floats, whatever else. Um, so that's one way. We also see that combined into a single table where uh, as part of the metadata, you know which, uh, which type a um, value will be in, and then you'll just have the separate types as part of your narrow model, and the ones, and, and everything will be null except the one type that that um, associated uh, metric um, has. So I might have a uh, val double column, a val int column, a val bool column, a val string column, right? Um, and I, I'll know which one to look at based on the metric that I am querying and based on its metadata. So that's one way that I've seen people do that and do that well. Um, it still means that still allows you to do aggregates over those things and and and, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, and, and you do have to do maybe a little bit more work in order to figure out which one you want to do uh, for a given metric, um, just because that's now stored in the metadata. Um, so your application might need to do that. But uh, usually that works out quite well uh, for the folks that, that, that have tried that. So uh, if there are no more questions, I'll move on um, to some fun time scale specific queries. So things like time bucket. Um, so you can aggregate metrics across time intervals um, and basically say we're going to take a bucket. Um, uh, oops. Uh, why is this? Not, there we are. Just takes a little while to, to change there. Um, so as we start bucketing this data, right, we might bucket into five minutes, 20 minutes, one hour, and it gives us different uh, a different view of how the trends work. Um, and with normal normal SQL queries, you can sort of extract things from times or you can truncate times, but it doesn't allow you to do this at different granularities. So if you want 10 seconds or uh, two hours or whatever it is, or five minutes or 20 minutes as shown here, right? That's not gonna work. So time bucket allows you to do that uh, simply and effectively um, and very quickly. Um, it also allows you to match timestamps across multiple different time series. Um, so if I have readings that are coming in uh, at, you know, 
every approximately every five minutes across two series, let's say, um, or even less frequently, I might bucket into five minute buckets so that I sort of align my timestamps. So in this case, we're seeing uh, buckets along, uh, say, hours, um, where one came in at 8.05, another came in at 8. I want to match them up. So I bucket them into our, uh, two hour buckets in this case, and that's going to allow me to do that um, and get the average, say, or the sum uh, of these metrics uh, in order to, to sort of join them together. Um, but what happens when you have a couple series and one of them has data for a period of time, and the other one doesn't? Um, so you might have a gap in your data. Um, well, obviously what you should do is you should uh, write this really horrible SQL query to interpolate your your data. I mean, this is this is how you would do it in in without time scale, right? You could you can write this. Uh, this is one of those queries where it is possible to do it in SQL, uh, but it's painful. Um, so we've replaced that, and we wanted to make that a lot easier, and also make it more efficient in terms of the way that we that we do that. And so we've in introduced this time bucket gap fill function, which then allows you to call another set of functions like interpolate or last observation carried forward. And these are two different ways that we allow you to fill in uh, sparse or missing data and say interpolate between two values or carry, carry a value forward. This is actually one of the ways that you can do those special tags that change uh, sort of slowly over time is you can use uh, gap fill in order to, to sort of fill in the tags over the long periods of times where they don't change um, and then have the correct tags associated with the correct uh, metadata for the given time periods that you need. Um, so let's see. Great. So that's uh, time bucket gap fill. That's one big thing. You'll also see, um, I think I actually cut out some of the things around first and last. Um, those allow you to order by uh, time and just pull values uh, based on the first and last value of uh, within a within a bucket or within a group. Um, and that can be very useful for various uh, time, time series based queries. So we have a few questions here. Let me pause and get a few of those. Okay. Uh, question one, would the timescale DB system be able to replace process historians like G, Prophecy, and OSI SoftPy? Um, we do see a fair number of people uh, doing things like that. Uh, it does, you know, we, we don't have all of the stuff around uh, some process historians. Like we don't do ingest from random data sources like they, they have a lot of connectors sometimes they also have whole special ways that you model your data in their specific system we don't have any of that we just have the ability to create your own relational tables so if you're willing to put in the work to do a little bit of modeling of, of some of those tags etc we've seen a number of folks that, that are using it very effectively to to replace uh, process historians or used as part of a process historian as well Okay, second question. Would there be a performant method to backfill data, data that was captured a year ago but is only delivered for ingestion today? Yeah, so um, backfilling data is, is usually just fine. Um, as we get into some newer features, there are a few limitations there, but for the most part, backfilling data is fine. We recommend filling uh, backfilling in, um, in loose time order still, if you can. Um, and it's not going to horribly affect uh, ingest rates as long as you are uh, uh, as long as it's a relatively small fraction of your data overall. Um, so in general, you know, we see backfills, if they're like one to 3% of your data, then that should be fine. We're still, most of our optimizations are gonna be fine. As we start getting to like 50% of your data, then some of our optimizations aren't going to work quite as well because uh, you're often gonna be writing to various points in time. So most of our optimizations are made for insert mostly workloads and for data that, that is mostly in the most recent period of time but it's not necessarily going to be just data in the most recent period. Um, is that it? Sure, one more. And can timescale be used when using logical replication? Uh, currently, no, we do not support logical replication as it doesn't uh, properly replicate the table creation that we do uh, in order to create new chunks. Um, and the replication only occurs uh, on the base uh, rel level. Uh, we can talk about what you need logical replication for um, and, and how we might support that in the future. Um, there are some, I think, feature requests out for that. If not, definitely make one on our GitHub uh, or come find me in, in the support Slack and ask me about it and we'll see uh, how we can support that in the future. It is something that I would like to add support for. So moving on, uh, manage all the data effectively. Um, so, Definitely know the difference between uh, deleting data and 
uh, dropping chunks, you want to make sure that you're you're dropping older data if, if that's what you're going to do. So instead of saying delete where less than X, you want to drop chunks older than 24 hours if you're planning on dropping data older than 24 hours. This is a common use case in time series where you're only keeping the, the data around for a certain period of time and then sort of some of it's falling off the back. We also allow you to do that uh, in an automated way so that we say, look, anything, any chunks that are fully older than 24 hours, we're just going to drop them. And that just deletes them completely from disk. You don't have to worry about all of the stuff around vacuuming and other sorts of stuff that happens when you delete data, um, where basically we we write a tombstone if you do a delete rather than um, actually just completely deleting the data immediately. Um, so that's one thing around dropping chunks. Um, and again, we, we do that in an automated way. And uh, just to show you sort of here, we'll do that on, on, the, older, uh, on the older times. And I, people always have trouble with this arrow. Some people like it this way, other people like it the other way, and it never, it never quite makes sense to me which way should be oldest, which way should be newest, but I guess we've chosen a convention, so so there I keep keep thinking it should be the other way in my in my head. Anyway, um, we also allow you to reorder data. So when uh, Postgres stores data, um, even if you have an index on it, there's no, no real primary key. Um, it doesn't actually write the full data in uh, in, in primary key order, there will be an, a secondary index, which means it's uh, stored out of line uh, from, from the raw data that points back to the data in the heap. So if you want to reorder the data in the heap, um, you have to use one of, uh, use either clustering, uh, which is a whole other thing and way overloaded as a term, but um, clustered indexes uh, are one thing you can do. But you can also use our reorder, uh, reorder chunk command, um, as well as our add reorder policy command. And this will rewrite the data in the order of an index. This can be very, very useful because data tends to come in in time order. And then we find that folks often have these patterns where they query relatively wide, um, shallow queries for the most recent data. So we say, let's look at all of the devices that have reported in the last 10 minutes. So that's a wide and shallow query. And then as we go backwards in time, I want to see all of the data for a single device for the last month. So as data gets older, the way that you manage it should also change. Um, and in this case, it's the way that we order it on disk. So instead of uh, having it in basically in loosely time order, um, we instead move it to being in device comma time order, because uh, we have an index on device comma time or something like that. Um, and just to give you an idea, this was our, this is our a little demo that we built around the, the MTA uh, so that's the, the, the Metropolitan Transit, Assor Transit Authority, so buses in New York, um, which is where I'm sitting now. That's where our office is. Um, and so we can see those over time. Um, and if we just want to find everything for a given route uh, where there's very little uh, time ordering, that, that takes a long time at first because all that data is spread out. If we then reorder all of the chunks on the index that includes the route, and then maybe time, suddenly everything is much faster because we're accessing a far fewer number of blocks on disk. Um, and it means it takes a whole lot less time because often we're IO bound there. We also have continuous aggregations. So as data gets older, you can uh, uh, add continuous aggregates that allow you to speed up queries over older data um, and already have that be, have some of the aggregation work be already done for you. Um, I, I can go into a bit more on how continuous aggregates work and all of that, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it here for now. But basically, you create a view with timescaledb.continuous. Um, these are often useful if you have a pretty high volume data for, and you're looking for individual, say, devices. Again, over time, I want the average over every, say, 15 minutes rather than, um, and it's coming in at, say, 1,000 points a, a minute. Right, then you're you're doing a lot less work when you go and fetch just the aggregates over 15 minutes or even at a minute level. Um, uh, I'm now only adding 15 things rather than 15,000 things um, for each 15 minute period. So that's a really nifty way of of, of doing things there. Um, and then we actually have a new a couple new features that are coming coming around soon. Um, so compression, uh, we are adding in a, a few ways to compress older data. Um, so again, this will act on uh, only uh, older data. Uh, we don't want to do it on the most recent data. So our inserts are going to happen in the, in the same way as, as normal. Um, and then we compress older to older chunks. Um, and that does, uh, and you can add some options around that. So you can do order buys, you can do segment buys. 
Um, and I will uh, also mention that there's a public beta of this available now. Um, and if you go to, I think, both our website and our public uh, support Slack, you can sign up for that public beta and get an early copy of that. Uh, 1.5 will be released sometime in October um, uh, for full availability, but we'd really love to have folks try it out um, and, and give us both some data on how it works, uh, as well as just you know help us find any bugs, all of that stuff as we're developing this feature. It's all completely transparent, so uh, all that compression uh, decompresses and all of that completely transparent to the user. You run normal SQL on it, um, but in the end, it's much, much, much smaller on disk, um, which is a huge cost savings, as well as uh, meaning that there are certain types of queries that are actually faster because we've basically traded I.O. for CPU. And, and it means that, that we can uh, actually do a lot more work because I.O. boundedness is a huge issue, especially for older and colder data. So the data that isn't in memory anymore, um, if you can limit the amount of I.O. you have to do on that, uh, as you're fetching it, it can really speed up queries on those colder chunks. Um, so that's one huge, uh, huge thing that's coming in in, in one five. Um, we also have data tiering. Um, some the, the the initial part of this will be in one point five, uh, which is which is actually just a move chunk function, which allows you to move a single chunk from one uh, table space to another. Um, eventually, we will also allow you to move multiple chunks together um, and add policies around that. Um, so I'll pause now again for a few more questions, and then I'll go into a few more suggestions for you. Okay, question I have is, uh, gap fill seems to be only available in the so-called community edition. Am I right? And what are the terms uh, to use this feature? Yep, uh, so gap fill is in the community edition. A number of these features are in the in, in the community edition. Um, the basic terms are that you can't be a database as a service provider. Um, so uh, basically, if you're Amazon RDS, you can't use the community version without talking to us. Otherwise, it is free for you. So if you're just using it for your application, it's totally free to use. Um, you just can't be providing a database as a service to other folks is the basic uh, way to do that. Uh, if you have more questions about that, I think we actually have a specific channel in our support Slack around licensing um, if you want to ask them there. Uh, and the full license is also available in a number of places online. Okay, so I'm going to leave this up for a second. Um, are there any more questions? No more came in. Cool. Uh, so uh, I'm going to say you should absolutely bookmark these. These are your friends. Um, uh, so so go to our docs. They're good. The Postgres docs are very good. Use explain.depez or some other explain tool in order to uh, learn more about why queries might not be performing. Uh, it looks like we might have another question. I'll leave this up so you can also write them down. Um, this will also be available later. So, Question is, how will the version 1.5 compression compare with ZFS block compression? Yeah, so uh, we're seeing significantly more compression than ZFS block compression. Um, and I can, I can sort of go into uh, some more details on that uh, if we have time right at the end. Um, but the basic gist is we are providing uh, data type specific compression. Um, we also allow you to modify how the data is ordered um, and do it on the uh, on a much smaller level than what ZFS does. ZFS basically is taking the full file system and compressing it. So it takes all sorts of like a, a number of pages in the heap or in an index, whatever, and compresses them together. What we're doing is we're actually taking the heap and modifying it a bit. It does mean that you can't have all of the same types of indexing, um, but it provides significant compression, uh, data type specific. It's more of a column format, um, and it means that access is often much, much quicker uh, for certain types of queries especially, but, uh, but on a number of queries, it actually speeds things up quite effectively. Um, and uh, it's often actually significantly more compressed as well because we're, we're, we're making it so that the, the same data type is all together, uh, which is much easier to compress. We're also using, again, specific methods for, for uh, specific data types. Um, so ZFS can be good for some things. Um, I actually don't think we've tried ZFS along with our compression. It might actually work reasonably well, depending on what you're doing. Um, especially if there's like relatively repetitive segments of compressed data. Um, so that's something that, that you could also try and see if you can get an even further uh, amount. But in general, we're seeing between 20 and 30x 
uh, or between let's say 10 and 30x compression on many of our customers' uh, data sets um, compared to uh, what it was before. Cool. Um, a couple other sort of tips and tricks. Um, in general, indexes should have discrete columns first. So your location or your device ID should be first and then time, because uh, you'll often have where clauses that say where device equals X or device in X, Y, Z, um, and time between or something like that. Um, and then more continuous values uh, should be second in created indexes. You can also, if, if you're on Postgres 11, you can also use um, include columns uh, in your indexes. So you can actually include extra columns in your indexes. They're not actually part of the ordering, but they will be included there. Um, and that can be very useful for certain types of use cases. Um, when you're doing bulk loads or backfilling, you want to have data in a, in a relative, in a, what's called a, what we say is a weak time stamp order. So basically you want to say, insert most of your devices, uh, from a long time ago and then the next sort of period of time and then the next period of time, et cetera, so that we try and keep some of this locality that we, that we get and make it look a little bit more like a normal load, uh, which is happening in time order. Um, and so the, the basic gist is uh, that that's the, you don't wanna do so, some things where we see people, that, that we see people do every once in a while, which is like, let's insert everything for this device and then everything for this device. And we're sort of uh, slamming our caches because we go through all of time for each individual device. Um, and that's really not useful for, for the way that we have optimized the database to, to really be more for weekly, at least weekly time, time ordered data. Um, in general, you also want to batch writes on ingest. So uh, use the Postgres copy command uh, with, with PsychoPG2, I believe. Oh man, what's the name of that uh, thing? It's execute values works. Um, uh, you can also use the copy to or from, um, but you can also just, just do a multi-valued insert with say a thousand rows. Um, if you have at least a hundred rows, uh, and then we see it say that the sweet spot's probably somewhere between a thousand and 20,000 rows per uh, batch. Um, we also have some tools uh, that, that will do that for you. So parallel copy will copy in parallel and batch things um, that uh, that uh, that otherwise wouldn't necessarily be batched. So you can see how the how the the progress is going as you ingest data. You can also um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, create your indexes after you've loaded old data. Um, and that can be faster uh, depending on, on how you're doing things. Um, so that's, a, that's an option that, 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 that can be good as well. Um, just a few notes on deployment options. We have a cloud service um, as well as uh, various options for uh, either deploying in, in a cloud of your own, so your own, on your own cloud uh, account, um, in say Amazon or Azure or uh, Google Cloud. Our cloud service is a fully managed service. Um, we do have uh, uh, VPC peering and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and then if you, or if you wanna do it on uh, local VMs and bare metal, we can also support that um, as well as with Kubernetes and, and other sorts of stuff. Um, so uh, this is sort of what our, our cloud interface looks like. Um, and we do offer, we do have a cloud promo if you guys want to get started with that for $300 of free cloud credits. Um, and then just a few other things for, for what's coming. We also do have a scale out clustering version that, that's coming down the pike. Um, so we have access nodes and data nodes, writes uh, go through a modified foreign data wrapper, um, and then reads also go through the access node and have uh, proper query planning and push down in order to make reads uh, fast as well. And eventually we'll also have, um, uh, we'll be able to scale it out so that you can do writes and reads across multiple access nodes. Um, so that's the basic gist on, on scale out clustering that's coming in the next several months. Um, it, if you want to be part of the private, private beta on that, uh, you're welcome to sign up. Um, there will also be a public beta in, in a, in a couple months, I think, um, that will be available for that as well. And we'll let you know when that's coming along. Um, and other than that, uh, that's the that's the community Slack that I mentioned. Oh, and there we are. That's the end of the uh, end of the, the slides. Um, 
so that's the community Slack that I mentioned. You can also find our source code uh, as well as licenses and all of that on GitHub. Um, cool, some questions. And is my okay. screen no longer presenting? We can fix that. Okay, uh, there was a new feature announced for a timescale native distributive edition. Uh, what is the current state on that feature as there was nothing more written? Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means, to be perfectly honest. Uh, maybe you can clarify um, and let me know. Okay, next question. Can you cover how alarms and events and their status is being handled? So in general, this is this is handled mostly outside the database. We don't offer uh, very much to, to, to do alarming inside the database. We often see people using things like Grafana, um, and other sorts of tools to do alarming on, on certain things in the database. Um, you can also use triggers and other sorts of things like that uh, if, you, if you need to in, in order to uh, handle events like that. Um, I think when I, when I mentioned event data in the beginning, um, it's much more around uh, how you query and, and, and store uh, event data, not necessarily so much around uh, events that then trigger some other action. Um, we don't have as many native capabilities around that, though. Again, we're happy to 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 hear more about what you uh, what you are looking for there, as there are some some thoughts of building uh, some features around that in particular um, for the future. So, if that is something that that uh, you you need, um, oh, uh, if that's something that you need, please do let us know. Um, and I think we are uh, basically done. We just hit our time, and it looks like GoToWebinar is also telling me that it has an error. So uh, it looks like I'll be signing off shortly. Um, uh, so uh, happy to answer more questions in Slack um, and, and otherwise. Uh, very, very glad to, to hear from you all, and thanks for all the questions. I really appreciate that. So thanks, thank you everyone. Guys. Have a great day.